My name is Nicola Wood. I'm an advanced nurse practitioner up in the South Yorkshire area. I work in Barnsley in general practice. Um, so amongst other things, I do a lot of work with the Primary Care Respiratory Society on their executive and policy panels. Um, I've also done some work alongside ARTP developing the spirometry guidelines and uh, some work alongside NHS England for medicines optimisation. So quite a varied background there. Uh, before I moved into primary care, I was a respiratory specialist nurse. So um, it's helped because I've got quite a good view through the whole patient pathway, right from them first presenting in primary care to what happens when they exacerbate or what happens when they get referred through to the specialists. So today, I'm hoping to go through with you what aspects to cover in a COPD review, to understand national and international COPD guidance, and actually to touch on the differences between these and why they might be there, and to put into practice some learned skills using case studies. So after the break, we'll go through and we'll use some of the things we've learned and try to apply them to some cases. So a good place to start is just with a quick reminder of what is COPD. And this is something that we should be checking our patients know when we actually do the reviews. You'll be quite surprised how many of them aren't really sure. So quick breakdown, chronic, so it's long term, it's not going anywhere, it's going to be around for the duration. Obstructive, meaning that the airflow is slowed down or obstructed. Pulmonary, just meaning lungs, and disease collection of symptoms. Now, before we get stuck into the meat of COPD, I wanted to just touch briefly with you <clears throat> on respiratory red flags. And the reason I want to go through this is because people with COPD are much more likely, so about 25% more likely, than the general population to develop lung cancer. However, we're much more likely to miss the signs as they often mirror COPD symptoms. So what are we looking for? And I think glancing at this list, probably some of these things are already jumping out at you as quite easily taken as part and parcel of COPD. So we're looking at frequent or unresolving chest infections. So particularly we're looking for changes. If somebody has had COPD for quite a while and gets the odd chest infection, but all of a sudden you really can't seem to get on top of symptoms, or they're just having one infection after another, we need to be making sure that we've looked at the possibility of lung cancer. Um, hemoptysis, so coughing up blood. Um, really, our patients shouldn't be. You might occasionally see a few streaks of very fresh blood after very vigorous coughing fits, but anything else, particularly older-looking, darker blood, anything that's happened um, with any sort of volume to it, we really need to investigate. Weight loss. So weight loss is a red flag for most cancers. Um, but what you might notice from that, if somebody's got particularly such as your emphysema, they do tend to burn through calories and they do become quite emaciated sometimes. So weight loss can sometimes be quite hard to catch. And it's just, again, it's thinking about what did this patient weigh last time I saw them? You know, do they look different? Are their clothes hanging off? Do they feel like they've lost a lot of weight? It's about recent changes. It's not so much about a long, steady weight loss. Uh, chest pain. So it's unusual to get chest pain with COPD. Some people may do if they've got damage to a particular area of the lung, but it isn't a usual symptom that you'd expect. So if somebody's presenting with a persistent pain in their chest that isn't central and crushing, because of course, if it is central crushing, we're thinking about heart first and foremost. But if it's, for example, in one of the lower lobes, if it's in the shoulder, the back, and it's just persistent, maybe affected by breaths, we need to be thinking about, well, what might be causing that there? Do we need to be looking at investigating? Uh, fatigue, again, it's going to be really common with COPD, particularly now, as a lot of our patients are quite deconditioned from being isolated and staying home a lot more. Um, but looking out for increased fatigue is really important because it's really easy to put breathlessness down to COPD, 
but if we're having changes that could be things like anemia which might be relating to a cancer um, or it might not be relating to a cancer but it's really easy to keep going keep going with inhalers and to miss these underlying other causes so look for these changes really specifically to your patients and persistent cough so again it's something that you will notice for some people however if you've got a new persistent cough if the cough has changed if they've normally got a really phlegmy cough and now it seems to be very upper airways and harsh just think about well, what's behind that change and so the recurring theme through all of these is what's changing what's different for this patient so the other thing just to look out for is finger clubbing so I get asked quite a lot when I bring this up, what does it look like? Well, so finger clubbing, it's non-specific in that it's an indicator of serious cardio or respiratory disease, but it won't tell you just from seeing it what exactly is causing it. So you can see from these pictures here, it's a change to the angle of the nail bed. And you can check that with your patient very quickly and easily just by getting them to put their two index fingers together in almost a bit of a M shape like so and you should be able to see a little diamond of light such as on the normal image and that is called Tramross window so when you lose that little diamond that means that the angle of the nail bed has changed so sometimes you can actually see finger clubbing it can be quite obvious that the tips of the fingers are a little swollen but you can pick up even early finger clubbing by just checking this and it is primarily a lung cancer sign and you'll find often on your two week weight referrals that finger clubbing and any new signs from a respiratory point of view they do want to investigate. So chest x-rays, so in COPD we're not going to be diagnosing COPD based on chest x-ray, it's not appropriate to do because thinking right back to the beginning if nothing else, we're looking at obstruction of airflow and we just can't see airflow on a chest X-ray. However, it can be useful when we've got new respiratory symptoms and we're looking to diagnose. Hopefully, if you're reviewing COPD, whoever started the investigations will have at some point requested a chest X-ray because new consistent breathlessness, new consistent cough, it is important to just have a quick look and make sure we're not missing anything obvious. That said, if they haven't or if the symptoms are not quite fitting, really important to just get that chest x-ray done. Um, if we're really thinking about lung cancer, so if any of those things that we've just been talking about are really sort of sticking with you and you're thinking, hmm, I've got a clear x-ray, but I'm quite surprised because I had some clear signs there. Bear in mind that not all lung cancer is detected by chest x-ray and about 20 to 25 percent of cases are actually missed so if you do strongly suspect um, anything like a, a lung cancer you can still refer even with a normal chest x-ray if you've got high suspicion so let's take a look at some guidance so actually this is from nice and it's looking at what do we do initially before we start on a pharmacotherapy point of view. Now, the reason I've taken this is because it's quite nice and easy to read through. But when you look at gold, they are saying the exact same thing. So the real key point here is think about these things before we start looking at inhaled therapies. So in this dark gray box, we can see that we're prioritizing stopping smoking, vaccination, <coughs> pulmonary rehabilitation, self-management and optimising everything else that is already going on. Let's talk in a little bit more detail about that and then we'll go into some more detail about the inhalers themselves. So first off, as we can see from the very, very top of this diagram, we want a confirmed diagnosis of COPD. So how do we check for a confirmed diagnosis of COPD? So initially, we need risk factors. So if you've got somebody who is presenting with symptoms of breathless nurse cough, you know, you're thinking, right, this sounds like COPD, but they have no risk factors, then it's not going to be COPD. So you're looking for, in terms of risk factors, occupational, which could be textiles, it could be working with small particles, such as in the building trade, 
Um, it could be chemical damage, so particularly chlorine actually is quite well known for causing lung problems if they've had exposure to it. And that might be people who manage pools who are mixing chlorine solution. Um, and very, very commonly, obviously, your miners. So, oh, and bakers as well, one that sometimes catches us out. If they don't have any occupational history, but they do have 20 pack years of smoking history, that's enough to do significant damage. And so what we might be thinking there, um, <clears throat> when you're working out pack years, just to do a quick refresher with you, we're looking, so 20 cigarettes a day for 20 years is 20 pack years. So that's the equivalent, one pack year is 20 cigarettes a day for a year. And the idea with pack years is that it gives a bit of a standardization to work out risks because everybody smokes a different amount for different years. Um, there's a really good pack years calculator if you just type that into Google and it is actually called pack years calculator and you can put it in for cigarettes per day for however many years and it'll work that out for you. But you need normally at least 20 pack years. <clears throat> Think about if they've been smoking anything else. So sometimes um, drugs might come into play Particularly if people have been smoking anything like heroin, it can do a lot of damage. Um, things like smoking sheesh pipes, sometimes people don't realise, but it is actually quite damaging to the lungs. And one session of using a sheesh pipe or water pipe is about 20 cigarettes. So if people are doing that daily, it soon adds up. But there should be risk factors. And if there isn't, it may be that we're looking at something else. So we might be looking at bronchiectasis from something that's happened when they were a child, like a whooping cough or pneumonia. We might be looking at um, <clears throat> alpha-1 antitrypsin disease, um, where basically the lungs become damaged a lot more easily. So if you've got somebody who's presenting very clearly like COPD, but they don't really have enough substantial risk factors to justify that. And these people really, they need to be under the specialist so that they can keep an eye on progress and ideally stop it as much as possible. Uh, so really think about your risk factors. You need spirometry. So you should be looking at post bronchodilator spirometry. Um, that is your confirming test. And so if somebody is controlled with the symptoms, if they've got uh, post bronchodilator spirometry so the airways are as open as they can be on inhaled therapies and the lung function is still abnormal and they're not managing to clear 70% of the volume in their lungs in one second we say it's slowed down and therefore obstructed and that is how you would confirm your COPD and of course they have to have symptoms so a person can have spirometry in the lower levels of normal they can have risk factors but if they've got no symptoms whatsoever, we don't make a diagnosis of the disease because they don't have that collection of symptoms. 